Chapter 12, The Pyramid in the Desert Sam spent the rest of the day at the hospital with his parents. It was a wonderful day and one he would remember all his life. They were all perfectly happy because they were together and his father was well again. He questioned his father closely as to what he remembered before his miraculous awakening. Well, his dad said looking thoughtful, I remember sudden terrible pain and falling to the ground and after that nothing, unless... Unless what? Sam asked. Well, at some stage, I'm not sure when, I had this really strange dream. Weird what your brain does. What was the dream? Sam asked. Well, I can't remember very clearly, but I was walking through a terrible dust storm, suffocating in the sand. Just as I fell to my knees, thinking I couldn't go on, a figure walked out of the storm, and as he walked, he opened a pathway through the sand, kind of like a sandy version of when Moses parted the Red Sea. When he reached me, the storm stopped altogether. Then he smiled at me and held out his hand, and I saw he was holding a round, colourful object. He told me to take it in a strange language, but somehow I understood him. I reached out for it, and then... I'm not sure. I don't remember anymore, Mr. Noel said. I think I woke up. It seemed incredibly real, though. I could feel the sand sticking my skin, smell the dust in the air, taste the grit in my mouth. Do you remember anything else? Sam asked eagerly, a bit too eagerly. His father gave him a puzzled look and said, No, it was just a dream. He was silent for a moment and then said, Well, one other thing I do remember which was odd. When the storm stilled, far away on the horizon, I saw something white gleaming in the sun. It looked like a pyramid. The nurse came in and said, Time for your scan, Mr. Nell. She turned and smiled at Sam and his mother. You won't be long, and then we're going to move you to a general ward. No more need for the ICU, I'm happy to say. They smiled back. They were very touched at how happy all the staff were about his father's miraculous recovery. The light of hope had shone unexpectedly into the grim intensive care unit and everyone was rejoicing. Sam put his hand up to his pocket and gave it a grateful little squeeze. How strange to know that both he and his father had seen the great pyramid of Temenhut. In the late afternoon, Peter's father came to collect Sam and to see Mr. Nell. He was so overcome when he saw Mr. Nell sitting up in bed, talking and smiling, that he was unable to speak. He just reached out and shook hands with his old friend and colleague, his eyes looking suspiciously moist. The barrage of tests done on Mr. Nell had all come back with the same astonishing result. There was no damage to his heart, or indeed any sign that he'd had a heart attack, or why he'd had a heart attack and he was in every way as healthy as anyone could wish for. The doctor said he should stay just two more days in the hospital, just to be safe. He couldn't believe that there was nothing wrong with a man who was dying one minute and totally recovered the next. When Sam got back to the farmhouse, he found Jane, Peter and Maylie sitting on the porch couch. Phoebe was on Maylie's lap, looking very pleased with herself and wearing a doll's bonnet on her head. They were all overjoyed to see him and began talking at once, saying how incredible it was that their mother had told them that Sam had gone to say goodbye to his father and then had come the wonderful and astonishing news that he was right as rain. How had this happened? This, said Sam, brandishing the stone, then returning it carefully to his pocket. I wished on the stone and I asked Tim and Hut and Ra and any guard who might be listening. He told them in detail what had happened and they listened open-mouthed. What made you think to use a stone? Peter said in wonder. I don't know if I would have thought of it. It's only ever worked for time travel. It's never granted any other kind of wish. I know, Sam said, but I thought about what the hieroglyph said about Timonhut the healer and the stone and how Prof Gamar wanted it, and it seemed worth a try. Jane giggled suddenly. Oh, poor parents. They're having a lot of unexplainable things happening suddenly. The camels, and now this. Yes, the doctors and nurses were besides themselves about it, Sam said. And the best thing is that it seems to have cured whatever problem my dad had that caused the heart attack in the first place. And he quoted, Those that he healed died only when the whiteness came to their hair. We were so worried about you and Uncle when we heard, Jane said. We couldn't believe it when we were told he was fine. And they sat for ages discussing over and over what had happened until Auntie called them to have supper at her house. After that, 
Jane and Sam walked back across the field to the farmhouse and prepared for bed. Mrs. Noel arrived back from the hospital just in time to tuck them in and wish them good night. She was tired but very happy and told Sam that all the tests indicated that his father was a healthy man. Good night, sleep tight, Sam, Jane said sleepily from her mattress after Mrs. Noel had gone, turning out the light and closing the door. I am so going to, Sam said sleepily. And tomorrow we must put the stone back in the pond. But the next morning turned out rather hectic and the stone remained in Sam's pocket. Jane awoke before him and decided to pass the time by checking her emails to see if there were any more from Prof Gamal. The had, after all, not yet replied to his urgent query. She logged on and opened up her mailbox. Six new messages. She opened it with a sinking heart, with the horrible suspicion that all six would be from Prof Gamal. They were. She went through them. They all began politely. Dear Mrs. Mulotto, I hope you've received my email with the translation. But as more and more of the emails had gone unanswered, it became sharper and more demanding. And the last one, sent only that morning, ended with the vaguely threatening line, I am becoming concerned at the non-reply to my emails, as I can go no further with my research until I know the source of the text that you sent me. I think it would be best and easiest for everyone if I came to see you. May I visit you at your school? Yours in haste and anxiety, Prof. J. L. Gamal. Holy cow! He wanted to go to the school. Luckily it was closed for the holidays. His visit would be fruitless. Still, it was alarming, and once term started, he could get hold of her with one phone call. What email? She could imagine Mrs. Malotto saying. I never sent an email with hieroglyphs. Let me see it. And she would immediately see it was from a learner at the school and trace it to Jane. Jane swallowed. They needed to do something to put the professor off the scent. An hour and a half later saw them all sitting in the treehouse, discussing the situation and eating a packet of chocolate digestives which Maylie had filched from her mother's treat cupboard. She felt guilt-free about the filching as she specifically asked her mother over breakfast, Mummy, can I have a doll tea party today? And her mother had smiled fondly and said, Of course you can. And Maylie had interpreted this as a go-ahead to take the biscuits, which she'd had had her eye on for two weeks. She had her dolls up in the treehouse too, and ethically offered them all a bite of each biscuit. Her conscience being entirely clear on the matter, she chewed happily as she listened to the older ones discussing the problem. We need to put him off permanently, or at least until you leave for high school, Peter added with a smile. It's not funny, Jane said crossly. It's jolly serious. It's my reputation at stake. I know, I know. Let's all think hard, Peter said placatingly. We need to think of a source that he can't go and check on and discover we lying. Which is tricky, Sam said, because he probably knows so much about the different archaeological sites where hieroglyphics are found. Yes, I bet he goes to museums all over the world and looks at their scrolls, the books of the dead and all that kind of thing, Jane said. I just can't think of a single thing to say to him, Sam said despondently. My mind just goes blank. I know what you mean. Everything I think of is no good when I think how he could check up on it, Peter replied. They sat and thought some more. How about if we say she got it from someone else and she doesn't know how to contact them, Jane said suddenly. Yes, that might work, Peter said. Actually, that's brilliant. Let's say a student who has left the school brought it in when they were learning about Egypt. We can say we, or rather she, thinks they got it from their parents who'd just been on a tour to Egypt, but she's not sure. The less definite we are about things, the better. Come, let's do it right away before he emails again, Sam said, and quickly descended the treehouse ladder, followed by Peter and Jane. Maylie remained behind. She took the remaining three biscuits out the packet and put them in front of her dolls. Does anyone want another biscuit? No? Had enough? Shortly after the email had been sent, a Land Rover rolled up to the farmhouse. It was some of the students, inviting the children to come and see their fossil being excavated so that it could be taken to the museum. The children were thrilled to see their new friends again and agreed to meet them shortly on the top of the disappearing hill. Sorry we can't give you a lift, 
Milo, one of the friendly students, said, but the car is full of the equipment we're going to use today. Today's the day we cut the fossil right out of the bedrock, so we have a generator and an electric saw and whatnot. It's okay, we often walk up the hill, Sam said. See you just now. And they all four rushed off to pack water and sandwiches for lunch and grab hats and sunscreen. Thereafter followed a very fun day. They started off by watching the rocks around the fossil being cut into, but as this was slow and horribly noisy work, they went off fossil hunting with some of the others and were thrilled to find several small fossils sticking out of the rocks on the slopes of the disappearing hill. The geology around here, by which I mean the rocks, tells us that this area was very wet during the Permian period. Lots of lakes and streams, one of the students told them. The boys looked at each other impressed. They remembered the meandering streams and rivers they had come across when they went back in time, and the massive dragonfly-like insects which had zoomed up the watercourse, frightening the life out of them. Encouraged by their interest, the students said, The rocks record the history of the earth. When you study geology, you learn to read them. It's great. Suddenly there's stories wherever you look. It's like being able to time travel. Then wondered why the boys laughed. At lunchtime, everyone sat and munched their sandwiches companionably, and Maylie and Jane told the students all about the canals that had appeared out of nowhere and how, how they were going to learn to ride them when their harnesses arrived. I'd like to go and see them, one of the students said eagerly. Is it true that camels spit at you when you annoy them? Jane frowned at him disapprovingly. Yes, it is, although it isn't really spit. They bring up a bit of what's in their stomach and spit at that out. So it's actually more like vomit. But obviously, one should never irritate one's camel so much that they do that. And Jane gave the student a hard look. She strongly suspected that he wanted to see the camels to try and make them spit at him. She became certain of this when he blushed, muttered something, and let the topic drop. After lunch, the children went on a Land Rover ride with two of their favourite students to go and investigate the hills some distance away for more fossils. It was late afternoon by the time they got back and they trailed slowly and tiredly down the disappearing hill back to the farm. Mrs. Noel had made a lovely supper of macaroni cheese and invited Maylie and Peter to say thank you for looking after Sam and Jane when she was away at the hospital. As the children tucked hungrily into the large, beautifully cheesy portions, she told them that Mr. Noel would be coming out of the hospital the next morning and she would be going to fetch him. The doctors are a bit worried in that they can't explain what happened, but as he seems 100% okay, they're letting him go. I'll leave straight after breakfast and he should have been seen by the doctor and discharged by the time I get to the hospital. She smiled happily at the children. It takes something like this to make one really appreciate what one has. The children nodded in agreement, their mouths too full of macaroni cheese to speak. Her words made Sam remember he still had the stone buttoned in his top pocket. He must go and put it in the pond tomorrow. Before bedtime, he and Jane went quickly to her email to see if there was a reply from Professor Gamal. To their surprise and relief, there was nothing. Well, hopefully that's put him off the scent and we won't hear from him again, Sam said. Yes, thank goodness, Jane replied. He was freaking me out. join us next week for chapter 13 Prof Gamal makes a wish